Good morning, Overflow. Good morning. All right. It is good to be in the house of the Lord again with you. Hey, man, we got some excited people out there. How many of you guys are happy to just be out of the house? How many of you guys are just happy? How many of you are just happy to be away from your spouses or your children? You know, they got on your nerves these past few months. How many of you are just happy to be away from them? Nobody? All right. All right. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. How many of you are just happy just to be near somebody else because you've been by yourself, you've been talking to the volleyball or basketball, and you're just happy to be with someone else. Let me tell you, it is truly, truly an honor to be with you, especially as we are, we gathering. Uh, I want to send a shout out to Pastor Brian, Pastor Joel, Pastor Chad, all the team. They made all of this possible. They did a phenomenal job making sure that not only We could properly social distance, but that we could worship God in safety and security. So let's give it up for Pastor Brian, Pastor Chad, Pastor Joel. They did a phenomenal, phenomenal job. All right. We are continuing on in this series that we call Things That I Wish Jesus Didn't Say. How many of you guys are enjoying this series right now? How many of you guys are enjoying the series? How many have experienced a life-changing transformation as a result of this series. And I know sometimes when we read these words, we feel like, Jesus, I was okay until you said that. Jesus, I was all good (laughs) until you said that. Jesus, you were my boy, but then you messed it up and said that. And really, honestly, what Jesus does is he challenges us to be better individuals. He's challenging us today to be better Christians. But so often, so many people are so comfortable in their dysfunction. So many people are so comfortable in their mess until when Jesus says these words, we look the other way because we don't want to hear them because we are comfortable in our own dysfunction. So many people are comfortable being Pharisees. We say one thing with our mouths, but we live something totally different. So many people are are comfortable being, you know, Sunday saints where they can gather on Sunday and they can worship and they can lift up holy hands, but throughout the rest of the week, they, they live totally differently. But what Jesus does here is he says, no, it's not about your rules and following your own rules and your own plan, but it's all about following my rules and my game plan for your life. I want you to follow my will to the glory of God, our Father. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, verse number 38. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 38. And it reads, you have heard the law that says punishment must match the injury. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. If you're sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. You have heard the law that says love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, 
What reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Man, what some powerful, powerful words. And these are some heavy words, right? And I know some of us, if you're like me, we read these words and we're like, Jesus, you are wrong for saying that. It's okay. All right. I mean, come on, be honest. I mean, some of y'all are like, oh, lightning is going to come down and it's going to... No, he's up top. We, we're, we're wondering, wait a minute, Jesus... Wait a minute, Jesus, I was okay with you when you said, blessed are the peacemakers. <laughs> I, I, was, I was all good when you said you are the salt of the earth and the light of the earth. Uh, Jesus, I was scratching my head when you said, if you think in your heart a sin, you have already sinned. But I just thought, Jesus, you were just having a bad day. But now you got to say, I got to love him. I got to love her. No, Jesus, you're going to have to take that back. You're going to have to take take it back now, Jesus. Do you know what they did to me? Do you know what they said to me? Do you know all of the gossips and all of the lies they spewed against me, Jesus. You must not know, Jesus, you got to take that back because I can't truly love him. I can't truly love her. And, And the reason why it's difficult for us to display this type of love, the reason why it's difficult for us to love our enemies is really simply comes down to one word. And that word is offense. The spirit of offense is a powerful, powerful tool that the enemy uses to keep us away from being unified, to keep us divided. See, we we, we get offended because someone else offends us. See, offense is much more than just someone does something that we don't like or we perceive that this person does something that we don't like. No, offense is also an attitude, a mindset, a disposition that we have when we feel like someone has wronged us. And now if we feel like someone has wronged us, now we can't talk to them anymore. When we see them in the office, we give them a stink eye. Y'all know what I'm talking about, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's, that's what the spirit of offense does. And, and so what happens is when the spirit of offense comes upon us, it keeps us from loving those who do harm to us. But the spirit of offense also steals our joy. It steals our happiness. And so Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 5, in essence, he says, when you're you're loving your enemies, you're not offended. (laughs) When you're loving your enemies, you don't have time for the spirit of offense to come upon you because you love them despite what they can do for you. And then Jesus says even further, he he gives us examples on how we are to love Our enemies, it's in the Roman, Greco-Roman context, but it's something that we can understand. And he says, if a person slaps you, you don't go across their head with a bat. (laughs) No, you you turn the other cheek. Now, some of us are looking at that like, that ain't me, Jesus. Look, I guess I just won't be saved. (laughs) Right? Because it's so easy When someone does something we don't like, what do we do? We get offended. And and not just get offended, we get even. (laughs) Right? We retaliate, we get revenge. 
And, and Jesus says that that's not the Christian way. That's not the kingdom way. The kingdom way is if somebody mistreats you, you double down on your love for them. You don't want to get offended by what they do. And he says the reason why is because even the pagans, even those who are non-believers, even those who are not a part of the church, love those who love them, are kind to those who are kind to them. So how different are you from them? Jesus said later on to his disciples, the world will know that you are my disciples because you love one another. The world will know that you are Christ's disciples because you love everyone despite themselves. Despite what they do. And so in order to love our enemies, we have to let go of the spirit of offense. Now, there are three things, three, three ways that I want to show you why letting go of the, spirit, uh, of the spirit of offense is so important, is so essential to maintaining our Christian walk. There are three ways that I want to share with you. Number one is that the spirit of offense, when it comes upon us, negates the true enemy that we have to fight. What, what am I saying with that? Number one, we get so caught up all the time with what someone else says until we forget that it's not that person that's really saying it. Let, let me show you in the Bible. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 12, the apostle Paul tells the church of Ephesus this one thing that we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and wickedness and rulers and spiritual forces in high places. Sometimes we get so caught up with what a person says until we forget that it's not the person itself or himself or herself that is actually a spiritual force behind the person that is leading and influencing this person to say it. And it's hard, right? It's hard because we can actually say, well, well what are you talking about, Brother Drew? I mean, I, I saw these words come out of her mouth. <laughs> right? I, I, I didn't see any green stuff come out of her mouth. I didn't see her head twist around. She didn't seem to be demon possessed. <laughs> right? <laughs> she said it. So now I got to get back at her because she said, it's hard. <laughs> right? But, but Paul is saying, what, what the Apostle Paul is saying to us is, look, it's not the person. Remember, there are spiritual forces that are against the body of Christ. And, and in order to deter you, in order to destroy you, in order to keep you from fulfilling what God has for you, the enemy will use these individuals at any given notice. And so the spirit of offense, we got to remember when it comes upon us, it, 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 it helps us, it, it makes us forget that we fight not against flesh and blood, but against the principality that is in power. Number two, the second important thing that I want you to know today is that the spirit of offense keeps us from enjoying the blessings of God. The spirit of offense keeps us from enjoying the blessings of God. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Starting at verse number 21. Matthew chapter 15, verse number 21. 
And it says, Then Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Gentile woman who lived there came to him pleading, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. But Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. Then his disciples urged him to send her away. Tell her to go away, they said. She is bothering us with all her begging. Then Jesus said to the woman, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. But she came and worshiped him, pleading again, Lord, help me. And Jesus responded, it isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. Ooh, we Jesus. She replied, that's true, Lord, but even dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath their master's table. <laughs> Dear woman, Jesus said to her, your faith is great. Your request is granted. And her daughter was instantly healed. Now, if that was one of us, <laughs> who you calling the dog, Jesus? <laughs> who? Who? Is he talking to me? Is, is he? I know you ain't talking to me, Jesus. You, you ain't calling me a dog. Oh, you, what? what? Oh, oh, hey, girl, her, hold my earrings for a second. Oh. <laughs> you may be the savior, Jesus, but you're going to need some saving today. <laughs> Right? Because, I mean, we would get offended. I mean, literally what Jesus does is he calls her a dog. <laughs> now, unknown I, 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 I to her, this was all a test, but, but Jesus said it. Now, if she got offended at Jesus' words, she would have left out without the blessing that God had in store for her daughter. And so what happens a lot of times when we get so caught up in our own emotions and our own feelings, we get so caught up in being hurt and I'm wounded and I feel a certain kind of way until we never reach what God wants us to reach. We never go where God wants to send us. And last but not least, the spirit of offense keeps us from receiving forgiveness. The spirit of offense keeps us from receiving forgiveness. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, starting at verse number 21. And it reads, Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? <laughs> no, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me. I will pay it. He pleaded, but his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested 
and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his debt, his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. How many of us have asked the father for forgiveness? How many of us? I, I, <laughs> all of those who are Christians you know, you have asked the Father, you have asked Jesus for forgiveness. If you have not, you are lying, right? Because we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And, and what happens is sometimes it's so easy to get caught up in our emotions that we're not going to forgive someone. And guess what? If we're not going to forgive then guess what's going to happen? The Father will not forgive us. Because forgiveness is predicated on the fact that, that we are showing forgiveness, we're showing pity, we're showing mercy on others. The same forgiveness that the Father gave to us, the, faith, the same forgiveness that Jesus gives to us on a daily basis, even though we sin against him, even though we don't do what we're supposed to do, even though we disobey his word constantly, the same forgiveness that is given to us, God wants us to give it to others. As the worship team comes up, I'm reminded of Jesus when he was on the cross. And just before he went to the cross, he was severely beaten to a bloody pulp. He was tortured. He was ridiculed. He was given the most excruciating form of death, crucifixion on the cross. And if that had been me, if that had been you that was on that cross, enduring so much pain and agony, we would have said, Father, wipe them out. <laughs> Father, Burn them to pieces. Father, don't do it too quickly because I want to see the pain in their faces. <laughs> but what did Jesus say? He didn't, he didn't say any of that. He said, Father, forgive them. Why? Because they know not what they are doing. I mean, that's powerful, right? Even no matter what he was experiencing, the torture, the pain, the agony, Jesus sets an example for us. Even though he had to carry the sins of the world all upon him and the sins of even those who were crucifying him, he still had the, the, the gumption, he still had the ability to say, Father, forgive Because he knew what he was called to do. He knew that he was called to die. What are you called to do? So let me tell you, because when, when you are called by God to do something, opposition is going to come against you. When you're called to do something Guess what? People are going to talk about you. People are going to gossip about you. People are going to say things that are not true about you. 
Spiritual forces are going to come against you to try to deter you and to keep you from fulfilling the calling that God has on your life. But let me tell you, if you can love no matter what, if you can let go of the spirit of offense, you can receive greater happiness, a greater blessing. Even Jesus experienced this blessing. How do we know? Because Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 that the Father was so pleased at what he did that he gave him a name that it was above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. Over the past few weeks, our country has endured such a painful, painful experience. And a lot of it is rooted in this whole mindset, this whole culture that when someone does something that we don't like or someone says something in social media we don't like, what happens? We get offended. And instead of listening, instead of trying to understand, and instead of showing empathy, what we do is we double down on our positions and we say, you don't have the right to say that. But what we need to do is we need to humble ourselves and listen and try to understand the pain and the agony others are going through. We need to let go of the spirit of offense where when someone says something that we don't like, we just double down and we we just go at them. Because that's not Christian-like. And that does not glorify God. Let us stand. Father, in the name of Jesus, We know that we have been disobedient to the words of your son, Jesus. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive others who sin against us. Root out of us the spirit of offense that keeps us from experiencing true blessing and true happiness in you. Root out the spirit of offense that keeps us from receiving forgiveness from you. Help us to forgive others just as you have forgiven us. We love you, Lord. We surrender to you. We submit our lives to you. In Jesus' mighty and holy name, amen.